Hey friends, welcome back. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about pull requests. And if you're unfamiliar with a pull request, it's basically a tool primarily in GitHub, but also in some other version control where you say, I've got this chunk of my code usually in a branch in Git, and I've got this chunk of code, which is usually the old code with some new code added. I want to add the new code into the old code, but I want to add it as a chunk, say, I added a new feature or I fixed a bug. And it might be one commit, it might be multiple commits, but I want to group them all together, give them a description, and allow you to review these changes together. It's a request, right? I want to review these changes and decide, is this something you want to merge in? Do we need to make changes before we do it? So it's a tool that a lot of especially open source repositories use, but also we use it for all of our day-to-day -day work at Titan to basically allow someone to say, I made these changes, can you check out these changes and make sure they work the way you want? So these are extremely helpful tools for multiple people on the same team to be working, but they're even helpful for one person because if you did a whole bunch of work here and a whole bunch of work there, but you had to pause that one before you can merge it, and then you're doing that work there and you need to be able to pull in the changes from that one, but not that one, or you need to say, oh, I remember I made that change, but I don't remember what it was connected to. Pull requests are tools for all these different ways for organizing our work while it's in progress and also understanding its organization later. So understanding how pull requests work Super, super helpful. However, in my experience, both as a programmer at Titan and then also as a programmer in the open source world, it's very clear to me that people don't always know how to use pull requests and how to do pull requests well. So that's why I wanted to do a quick series about pull requests. And the first video of this series is basically how to make your pull request stand out. How do you make it very easy for me to review your pull request, to understand what's going on, and to want to merge it right away? Because if you do a pull request, your goal is for it to get merged, right? So help me help you help me merge your pull request and we're going to talk right now about the eight primary things i think you should do in order to make it more likely that your pull requests are going to get merged so let's get started my number one tip for making your pull requests stand out and making them more likely to get merged is define a clear goal and stick to it your pull request should do one thing the goal of your pull request is to make this new feature or it is to uh, fix that one bug or it is to make this one modification and the more things it does or the less clear it is and the harder it is for reviewers to understand that we're reviewing but it also introduces a lot of possibilities where what if they like your changes in one piece of it and not another and this one right here you can see we're working on this project i just created called tuber i don't even know what's going to do but it's going to involve youtube at some point it's really just an excuse for you know making some pull requests um, for this video but we've got this pull request it's called prep stuff well, I don't know exactly what that means, but I also see 78 files changed, no description. This is making me nervous. And when I come to the 78 files changed, I'm noticing we're getting linting things with GitHub Actions. We're getting actual linters being run, so code styles changing. This is Laravel Breeze, so we've got Breeze added. Okay, we've got a YouTube dependency being added. We've got a whole bunch of Breeze components. You can see with this, oh wait, routes to web, got something here. All right, looks like we are pulling in some videos on the homepage. So this is a unclear, unconcise pull request, right? There's no one clear goal. There's not a clear goal to add Breeze. There's not a clear goal to do whatever this thing is doing on the homepage. Whoever wrote this pull request, that was me, didn't sit down and say, I'm gonna do one thing. And it's a really common problem where people are building a pull request and they don't just say, what are the things that I wanna accomplish in this? What is the one simple thing? And, and if you wanna think about it, think about, am I putting enough things in this pull request that someone might wanna approve one, but not the other? or they might be ready to merge one, but not the other. If so, that should be two different pull requests or three or more. A pull request should be able to be identifiable as doing one thing, and it should be merged when that one thing is done well, and it should be ready to go when that thing is one done well, and not worrying about, oh, well, but what about all the other things that it's doing? So you have one primary goal and stick to it. The second thing we'd like to do is to write a clear, concise, descriptive title. Number one, remember, was define a clear goal and stick to it. And this leads perfectly into number two, which is to define a clear and concise and descriptive title. So prep stuff does not make it clear to us at all. Now, obviously, this particular one is so complicated. There's so much going on that it's going to be hard, but let's just try and write it out. So we have install and run duster, which is the linting tool. We'll require and install breeze. And then we're also add YouTube videos to the homepage. So unfortunately, this clear title is not concise 
It is descriptive. We know what it's doing, but it's revealing the fact that we don't have a clear goal. But at least from reading this title, you know exactly what it's doing. Now, sometimes there are more complicated pull requests, so even a simple title doesn't get you everywhere there. But it's going to get us a really good step in the right direction if we at least understand what it's supposed to be about. Now, do I know what add YouTube videos to the homepage means? What do they look like? Which, whose videos or anything like that? No, but at least it gets you into the right place. All right, tip number three is give me a TLDR. And if you're not familiar with TLDR, it means too long, didn't read. Often you're going to get these pull requests, and I didn't write one up like this, but it's going to be five paragraphs long, and often for very good reason. There's lots of complexity to what a pull request description is. So what I want us to start with at the top of every single pull request is, you don't have to exactly say TLDR, but you can if you want. TLDR sets up the basic tooling required for the site. Right, and that wouldn't be, that's not if we had the add YouTube videos, but if we were just doing Duster and Breeze, we could at least say, okay. And then down here, we might be doing all of the lorem, like do I have a lorem ipsum thing? Ha, <laughs> sure do. All the stuff that's gonna describe all the context of why we chose to use this version of Breeze versus the other Breeze and whatever other things that are going on. But I don't always have the ability to start here. So this right here allows me to go from a high level understanding from the title to at least like a little bit more robust. Now in this one, it's not, not any more robust, but again, often it would be, this is a paragraph and then this is 10 paragraphs. So give me a really simple, between the title and this TLDR, give me a really simple understanding of what it is that I'm working with here, why it's here, Often the TLDR, and again, it doesn't have to say TLDR, but often the TLDR will tell me what is the problem we're trying to solve here. There was a bug linked to the bug. Here's a feature linked to where the feature was requested or whatever. Give me the basic stuff in here that allows me to know what I'm dealing with. All right, number four tip for you creating an incredible pull request is to give me context and instructions in your description. So for example, we will look at this add YouTube videos to the homepage. Well, it'd be really helpful to know why. It'd really, really helpful to know how to test it. Um, and what steps we need to take before we're even able to test it in the first place. But let's talk about this YouTube videos. So YouTube videos, um, say something like, you know, it was requested here, whatever, to do whatever, um, to test. Number one, get a YouTube API key. Because if you look at this thing right here, I'm gonna look at this code and hopefully when I'm reviewing it, it's not gonna be this big. But if you go to route slash web.php, it's coming in. This right here is not gonna work unless you have a functioning API key. But would I know that from looking at this? No, I'm like, okay, great. I'm just gonna download this and I'm gonna you know, run the route and it's gonna show me these videos, right? Wrong, it's not going to because it's using a, a dependency called YouTube that requires you to set a particular environment variable. Well, I as the reviewer don't know that. So I'm gonna try and pull this thing down locally. I'm gonna try to run it and it's not gonna work. Not only is it not gonna work, but I'm not gonna know what I'm supposed to be tested anyway. So here's some test instructions. Get a YouTube API key from, and then you know put your link here. I think it's like this, um, with X permissions, right? And then number two, um, add an environment variable named a YouTube API key, I think is what it is, to your .env file with that API key. And then open up the homepage in your browser and make sure you see a list of videos from Matt's YouTube channel, right? So we're understanding what are the dependencies that we need in order to test this thing? Um, what are the steps to reproduce it? And then of up here, remember this is where you're saying, you know, like, why are we doing this? you know, Sally requested that we do this here. So we know now we understand the backstory behind the request here. We understand what was described to us by the person who requested this feature or bug or whatever. Um, we've also got uh, the, the kind of like their overall description of what they're doing. And then we have the instructions for us to be able to test this thing. And you won't, you can't even imagine how much better it is when you have been told how to do it. Because the amount of time I do, I spend just like opening up the files changed and trying to parse through, you know, what is it doing? And then I'm like, cool, I understand what it's doing. I pull it down locally and it doesn't work. And then I have to dig through, oh, well, they put, it, put in this dependency. In order for that dependency to work, you need to do this thing and you need to pull that thing there. And they'll just say, grab a YouTube API key. I'm like, where, how, what, when, right? So make it as easy as possible. And the thing is you're sitting in here totally understanding everything about this. And you're about to send this pull request to somebody who has not thought about this particular feature ever or in ages or whatever. So while your brain has all these things present in it, get it all in here and make it easy for them to work with. So number five, most useful thing you can do to make your pull request helpful is link to existing issues or cards or whatever else if possible. So I already talked about the fact that you want to give context in your 
your description. Let's say you link out to Trello or Jira. But the thing is, you can also do those things in GitHub. And it's actually even more valuable in GitHub if you're using GitHub issues to store what you're doing. So it looks like here we have GitHub issues for install Duster, use Tuber logo, and pull something interesting from my YouTube. Well, it turns out that this oversized pull request that should be more than one pull request actually installs Duster and pulls something interesting from YouTube, right? So what you can do is in the pull request description for this particular pull request, you can actually link directly to those. Um, installs and runs Duster. And then you can specifically just re refer to number one there if you want. And that just kind of makes a link to it, which is fine. Because if you click on number one, you can go over here. And now you can go here and you can see Matt Stopper mentioned this issue. But even cooler, you can say closes or fixes number one. If you say closes number one, that means when we merge this thing, it's going to close this issue and it's going to say closed by this pull request. So if you're able to link directly to the issues in GitHub that caused you to make this pull request in the first place, you're going to get notices of them. They're going to be cross-linked to each other. And if you use that specific language, closes number one or fixes number one, it'll actually close it when you close the thing. Really fantastic stuff. All right. Number six, use graphics, recordings, or GitHub styles, for example, tables when applicable. So if we're working on something that has any graphic styles at all, for example, add YouTube videos to the homepage, and I'm reviewing this, I'm now gonna have to pull the whole thing down, I'm gonna have to npm install, npm run dev, I'm gonna have to build it working locally, I have to make sure my API keys are set up correctly in order to just test to make sure you did this right. What if you threw a screenshot in here? Or if it's an interactive thing, do a quick screen recording and upload it there. And it can be super, super easy, especially if you're in the Mac, you can just do something like tuber.test, and I, th I believe it's control command shift four. So obviously this is not what a good design would look like, but you do this, you grab it, and then you just come over here and you can paste it directly into this field. Go down here and say, look at that. Now, you could still test it if you want, but you don't have to test it if you want, because if it's purely a visual change, you can actually just look at it and say, yep, that's what I want the visual to look like, that's great. Again, you can do this with a screenshot, you can do this with animation, and there's some other cool things you can do in GitHub other than just that. So you can do GitHub Markdown tables, so if you can see, you can just grab something like this and it's going to render it that way. And if you're not familiar with it, with this, you can edit Markdown anywhere in GitHub and you come in here and you don't actually have to save it to see how it turns out. You can hit preview and preview will allow you to see how it's going to render. So you can do tables, which are very helpful, but there's a lot of other cool things that you can do. You can do sections that are collapsed by default. And then when you click on them, they expand out. You can do code blocks, which is something I do all the time. So if you do three ticks, code and then three ticks, you're going to get a code block. But if you put the name of the language right after the three ticks, it'll actually handle it directly with that one. So you can do tick, 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 HTML, tick, 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 uh, PHP or whatever else, and it'll specifically handle it for that. And you can do a lot of other cool stuff that we don't often do in a day-to-day -day basis, but you can create diagrams using something called Mermaid, which just check out the Mermaid documentation. I mean, you can build this right here just using Markdown. It's pretty freaking incredible. You can do mathematical expressions. Um, I don't do any of this kind of stuff, but I mean, imagine being able to create something like this in line. It's pretty amazing. So there's all sorts of really cool things that you can do just using a little bit more robust things than just text. So try all those things and you can make these so much more robust and so much easier for your reviewer to understand what's going on. All right, number seven, write tests if possible. Now, not every single code base has tests already, but if you are in a code base that has tests or the ability to write tests, one of the most useful things you can possibly do to the maintainer of the project that you're working on is write a test that proves that the thing that you added or the thing that you fixed is now the way it should be. This is especially helpful when you're fixing a bug. You write a test that proves that in the old code, the bug was there, and then you fix it in your pull request. And so I can take that test and I can copy it on the existing app and notice that it's red. And then I can take that test with your pull request and I notice it's green. Super helpful. It's a really great way to document what it is that you're working on. And now it makes sure that the thing that you fixed here will never get unfixed in the future. And finally, Review your pull request before you assign it to somebody else. There's amazing, it's amazing how many things that you can discover that you didn't quite fix the way you wanted or that you mixed up just a little bit if you just look at the, um, the pull request. And first thing you want to do is check to make sure that they have any linters or any tests that are not getting run automatically. Now, if they are getting run automatically, you're going to see them down here and it's going to say, oh, this thing failed and you can see the details of how it failed. But if they're not getting run out automatically, you still want to run their linters. So check the project you're working on to see if they have any linters or any tests that you should be running and run them. And it's totally fine to push it up and say, oops, forgot to run the tests. You run the tests, you discover that they're red, you fix it, you push up a fix. And you can even say, 
you know, in the title, you can change the title to say work in progress, or you can say something here, say work in progress. Sorry, I didn't fix the test, something like that. Not a problem at all. Get the linters done. But then again, before you're really asking anybody else for help, you go over here and you actually look at the files you change as a reviewer or as somebody putting in a pull request, as you're reviewing the files you did, you just hit viewed. And slowly you work your way through all the changes you made. And the thing is you're going to find things in here almost every time until you get a little bit more used to it that you go, Ooh, I didn't intend to commit that. So for example, if you go here, I was building this whole thing and I wanted to submit it and look, I accidentally left a dump and die in there. And if you're not a Laravel developer, what basically happened was I left a debug statement in here. You certainly don't want to leave debug statements in there. And there's often other things that you discover that you wish you hadn't done when you read it first, the amount of problems I've caught from just reading my pull requests before somebody else sees it is amazing. But additionally, you can go in and say, huh, this thing right here, let's call it this right here, isn't clear. And I don't need to write my code any differently, but I want the reviewer to know what's going on. So you can leave a comment to the reviewer that just says, FYI, this is here because ABC, right? You should add a single comment. And so now when the reviewer is looking through their co your code, you have been able to give them a specific note about why that's there that makes it so much easier for them to understand and review it. So the last thing I want to do is show what a good pull request looks like. So I split this pull request up. It actually should be three pull requests, but I split up into two for now, one simple one and more like a feature one. So for a simple one, we're adding a linter here called duster and we're running its fixes. So we say duster is a code linter. This PR adds duster, adds GitHub action and runs the fixes locally. So the GitHub action won't fail. Now the problem is we're still in a place where this pull request does a lot. It both changes the code style everywhere and it pulls in the dependency. But what I did here, as I said, to see just the changes to add duster without the code style changes, check out this commit. And as you can see, I intentionally made two different commits, add duster and run duster. So while this pull request is add duster and run its fixes, we were able to separate it out by commit. So if I click there or click there, you can see just the commit that adds duster without it actually being run. The benefit of this is we can see when that one happened and we can see the changes from that separately from the changes to actually run it. But additionally, this pull request actually uh, succeeded because if we had just added duster and pull requested it, we would then have a failing check because one of the things it did was add a GitHub action and that action would have been failing if we didn't also run it. So this allows us to have a successful pull request that does a little bit more with commits that individually show us the individual things. And as you can see here, it also says closes number one, which is install duster. Now, separately, we've got a pull request here that says add YouTube package and show four YouTube videos on the homepage. It's got your TLDR, grab the top four videos. It shares that it closes number three. It gives a little bit of context. In number three, I described what I'm trying to do here. And then I talked about a little bit of the process of figuring out why I picked this particular package. Uh, steps to test, it shows you how to get a YouTube API key from Google, how to set that in .env. And then since this is a visual change, we got a screenshot of what it actually looks like. So someone can review this code, they can look at the screenshot, and they don't even have to run it locally because they understand what it's doing. So this is a really great pull request, and I would love to see more pull requests like this. So that's it for today. Next time we're going to be talking a little bit more about pull requests and what the experience is like for a reviewer reviewing a pull request. Both so if you're going to be reviewing your own pull requests in the future, you have the ability to do a better job of it, but also so that you as a pull requester have a better understanding of what we as reviewers are going to be going through to help you make it easier for us. So uh, stay tuned and make sure you subscribe to watch out for that one when it comes out. See you later.